lucky enough to work with our Parkinson's patients at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and I will be presenting general information about Parkinson's disease. So we're going to go through an overview of PD, a little bit about its history, some key statistics, and who it affects. So what is Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's disease happens when, in a certain area of the brain, we have a loss of neurons. And that area of the brain is called the basal ganglia. So within this yellow rectangle, that dark structure is representing the basal ganglia. The little red circle down here is the substantia nigra. That's where the brain cells are that produce dopamine. And dopamine is a chemical that's in your brain um, that is responsible for movement, initiating, modifying, perfecting movement, and it also plays a role in emotional regulation. So when we have Parkinson's disease, there's a loss of those neurons or brain cells in the substantia nigra, which causes the symptoms of Parkinson's. This is a picture that represents like zooming into how the dopamine moves down um, a neuron or a brain cell. So those little red, uh, yellow circles represent the dopamine um, as it moves from one brain cell to the other. And it crosses what we call the synapse, the area between the two brain cells, and it binds to those spiky things called the dopamine receptors. Then it has its effect throughout the um, rest of the body. In Parkinson's, as you can see on the right-hand side, there's far less dopamine that's being transmitted um, across the synapse to um, the receiving neuron. And so when that happens, it, it affects your movement and it can affect your mood. The history of Parkinson's, um, it was first described in 1817 by Dr. James Parkinson, who was a physician in London. And he wrote an essay called The Shaking Palsy. And it was basically um, him describing a subset of patients that he would see with symptoms that we all know today as Parkinson's disease. Some key statistics. Uh, Parkinson's is one of the most common neurodegenerative diseases, second only to Alzheimer's disease. And it's the fastest growing uh, neurodegenerative disease in the world. 90,000 new diagnoses of Parkinson's are made each year in the US. 10 million people live with Parkinson's disease worldwide. One million of those people live in the US. Men are about one and a half times more likely than women to develop Parkinson's. And um, the population over 65, it affects about one to 2% of that population. So who gets Parkinson's disease? We have um, several famous um, People up here, Michael J. Fox is very well known um, for doing a lot for the Parkinson's community. Um, Linda Ronstadt, Alan Alda, Muhammad Ali, Billy Graham, Janet Reno, George H.W. Bush have all shared their diagnosis, which is really helpful because it helps bring more light to the disease process and the need for further research. So causes of Parkinson's disease, we're going to look at um, the impact of age, environmental exposure, and genetics. So we can't pinpoint one specific thing that causes Parkinson's disease. We really think it's a combination of age, exposure to certain things in your environment, and genetics. So genetic. We have about 10% of all Parkinson's um, diagnoses are the genetic form. Those people have a very strong family history, maybe dad, grandma, grandpa have had it, or sisters, brothers. Um, and there's genetic mutations in a group of genes. The most common ones I have up here are PARC7, LARC2, the PARKIN, the alpha-synuclein, 
and these gene mutations get passed down through families. We know that age is the most, um, is the strongest risk factor for Parkinson's. And environmental exposures also play a role. So exposures to toxins, pesticides, like Paraquat, um, Agent Orange, um, people who have grown up on well water have a higher risk of developing Parkinson's and living in rural areas also have a higher risk of developing Parkinson's. So now to kind of move into the symptoms, when you're first diagnosed, you come in and we take a really good history. You know, what are you experiencing? When did this start? We ask you a lot of different questions. And then we'll do an exam that is looking specifically for these three symptoms. So bradykinesia, that's a medical term for slowness or smallness of movement. So when we have you do the finger taps and the open and close and over and back, we're looking for how, how big and how fast you can do those movements. So you may have somebody who can do it big, but it's very, very slow, or they can do it fast, but it's really, really small. Either of those are referred to as bradykinesia. So you may hear your provider talk um, and mention that word. So we're just talking about slowness or smallness of movement. Tremor, a lot of people have tremor, and the tremor is at rest. So when you're just sitting watching TV or you know sitting there, your hand is, is shaking. Rigidity is uh, muscle stiffness. So when you come in and we're doing your exam, we're moving your arms around, we're looking for rigidity. How stiff are you? Postural instability is not only balance, but like people tend to fall backwards and maintaining that posture um, is very difficult. And this puts you at risk for falls. And then typically when you're first diagnosed, it's, it affects one side of your body. So when we talk about the symptoms of Parkinson's, we're talking about it in two ways, motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms. And motor symptoms are the things that we can see or we can assess, right? Like, so resting tremor, the slowness, smallness of movement, rigidity when we move you around. Hypomimia is a medical term for decreased facial expression. So maybe just be decreased blinking, um, maybe not like smiling as much or have that natural facial expression. Um, gait, so when we look at a Parkinson's gait, typically there's reduced arm swing. You might have more stooped posture, um, shorter, maybe shuffly steps. Hypophonia is a medical term for a quiet voice. So it sounds to the Parkinson's patient like they're talking at a normal volume but we hear it as being very quiet, but inside their head, it sounds like a normal volume. And so really the treatment for that is practicing to project your voice and, and re-adjusting um, that volume in your head, getting used to um, talking louder. And then dystonia. Dystonia is, I always use writer's cramp kind of as an example of dystonia, where you know, you're writing and then your hand kind of curls or claws and you have to push your hands, um, push your fingers out. It, that can happen with um, toe curling. So the muscles get tight, the toes curl. Um, and so sometimes we'll use Botox for that. So the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, um, mood changes, sleep issues, constipation, memory issues, uh, and sometimes hallucinations, orthostatic hypotension, and urinary issues. So when you come in for your appointment, we have a questionnaire that a lot of people are kind of gripe about a little bit because it's a lot of different questions. But the reason that we do the questionnaire is because we're assessing you for all of these things. We're asking about all of these issues so we can really make the most out of your appointment and make sure we address the issues that maybe you're not aware are related to your Parkinson's disease. 
So I'm going to go into the non-motor symptoms quite a bit because, you know, they're the most undertreated, I think. Everybody can see a tremor or see stiffness, see how it's affecting your gait. So I think as a community, we're very good at, okay, well, let's adjust your meds for that. But the non-motor symptoms really can affect your quality of life. So mood changes. So depression and anxiety are actually symptoms of Parkinson's. It can cause decreased quality of life, and it affects about 50% of people with Parkinson's. And it will affect them differently. Some people will you know, have sadness. Some people will have apathy, which means they don't really feel like doing much of anything. They're not interested in the things that they used to be interested in before. Some people are more um, irritable, maybe quicker to anger or get frustrated. They can have trouble sleeping, excessive worry. Um, it can affect concentration. And when these issues are treated, the disease becomes more manageable. And the other important thing to realize is that the degree of depression and anxiety doesn't necessarily correlate to the motor symptoms. So I could have somebody who is doing great as far as their tremor control, their stiffness, their slowness, they're walking, they're exercising, but they're so anxious. And so their quality of life is still poor because of that anxiety or that depression. And so it's extremely important to, you know, have open communication with your provider about these things um, so that you can live the best life. So treatment options, we use medications, counseling, exercise. Um, Dr. Rush, who's one of our psychologists, is going to be doing a talk later today about living with these issues and how to best treat them and manage them. Sleep issues are also very common in Parkinson's disease. People will typically have vivid dreams um, or REM sleep behavior disorder, which means they act out their dreams at night. So it might be flailing around, kicking, punching, yelling. Um, sleep fragmentation, they can fall asleep okay, but then they're up frequently throughout the night. Or insomnia which a lot of times can be related to untreated depression or anxiety. So there are definitely treatment options for this. And actually, the next talk in this room is going to be by a sleep specialist. Um, and so you know, if that's something that you're interested in, I definitely encourage you to, to stop in for that presentation. Constipation. This is another big one. And this actually predates the diagnosis of Parkinson's in a lot of cases. So we define constipation as a less than three bowel movements in a week, okay? And what happens is the muscles that are responsible for pushing, you know, stool through your bowel are slowed down. And when it slows down, your body will reabsorb the water from the stool, which makes it harder than to even push it through. And so there are conservative treatment therapies that we can use for this um, to, to improve the constipation issue. Memory. So memory issues can be anything from word finding difficulties to having difficulty planning and organizing tasks you want to do around the house. Um, and it can range from being annoying to impeding your ability to do everyday tasks. Stress and mood issues will absolutely worsen um, these symptoms. And sometimes even there are certain medications that we can identify that can contribute to memory concerns. Neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. <clears throat> this is when your blood pressure changes and drops when you change positions. Everybody's blood pressure is going to fluctuate when they go from laying down to sitting up, sitting up to standing. But this is a drop of like 20 points on the top number. So if your blood pressure is 120 over 80, say, 
you're going from 120 sitting down to 100 standing because your, your body is trying to get more blood to the brain. But when you have a drop in blood pressure like this, sometimes you'll feel lightheaded, dizzy. Some people even pass out. Um, so when you come into the office, we should be checking your vitals, sitting and standing. And we do that to screen for this issue. The other important thing um, to mention is that probably about 80% of Parkinson's patients are dehydrated. And so when we identify that this is an issue for people, we're like pushing water, water, water. Six to eight glasses of water a day um, is what your goal is. Some people we use compression stockings, eating small frequent meals throughout the day. Um, you can raise the head of your bed so you're not laying flat all night. And then first thing in the morning, you know, that, that's a big position change. So sometimes that'll help. Drinking 16 ounces of water first thing in the morning is also beneficial. Sometimes if people are having syncopal episodes or passing out, we will put them on medications to keep their blood pressure elevated. And then urinary issues, uh, about 30 to 40% of people with Parkinson's will have urinary difficulties. And it's typically urinary frequency or urgency. So you're either running to the bathroom frequently throughout the day, or when you gotta go, you gotta go, and you gotta get there on time. Um, also, it can, it can affect when you're sleeping at night, so getting up frequently to urinate. Kegel exercises are actually extremely effective for this issue. Um, make sure that you're not drinking within three hours of going to sleep. That can help with the nocturia quite a bit. And then medications. Sometimes we'll need to use medications. So there are many treatments for Parkinson's disease. Medications, um, of course, everybody knows about Cinemed or Carbidopa Levodopa, which actually converts into dopamine, that chemical that you're lacking, converts into dopamine in your brain to have its effect. Exercise, we know through the research that exercise is extremely important. Um, and it actually helps slow the progression as well as improve um, symptoms of Parkinson's. And I really saw that during COVID. So I had patients who were doing great exercising and then like all the gyms shut down, people weren't able to go to rock steady boxing or their exercise class anymore. And they could tell a difference in, in their tremor, in their ability to walk, in their overall health um, and outlook on how they felt they were doing with their Parkinson's. Physical therapy we use for balance and gait issues. There's no pill that it's gonna make your balance better. So physical therapy is extremely important. A lot of times we will send people yearly to be evaluated. Um, so once you find a good physical therapist, make sure you become their friend because they will be you know, extremely beneficial for you and your diagnoses. Speech therapy we use for the hypophonia or the quiet voice. Occupational therapists are great. Uh, they help with handwriting, dexterity issues, everyday kind of issues that you have at home, like how do I, how do I, um, do a certain task, or my tremor is bothering me, I don't wanna go out to dinner. Um, they will, they will um, help you come up with a plan and work with you to improve those issues. Botox injections I mentioned um, for dystonia. We also do it for if somebody's having drooling, uh, they inject into the salivary gland. And then the surgical options for Parkinson's disease um, deep brain stimulation, this is where they implant a lead and um, into your brain and it, you can direct stimulation through that area of the brain and it, you have a similar effect to that of the medication. 
And then focused ultrasound is an ultrasound therapy that they, um, you know, it's not an incision, they direct it from the outside. It helps treat tremor. It doesn't help with stiffness and slowness, whereas the deep brain stimulation will help with tremor, stiffness, and slowness. So my key takeaways are Parkinson's can cause motor and non-motor symptoms. You know, make sure you're addressing the non-motor symptoms just as much as you're addressing the motor symptoms because they're extremely important for quality of life. Keep open communication with your provider about the symptoms you're having and experiencing. And, you know, I always recommend my patients write down their questions because when you get in the room, it's like, I want to ask this, this, and this. But sometimes we get talking about something else and you forget. So make sure you write down your questions, bring them in. And another helpful thing is if you keep track of when you start a medication, what'd you start it for? Did you have side effects? Did it work? Why'd you stop it if you stopped it? Because you may start out with a local neurologist or your primary care doctor, and then you may come to a movement disorder specialist, and they may say, hey, have you ever tried amantadine? Or have you ever tried Azelect? And yeah, that sounds familiar. Okay, well, do you know why you stopped? I don't remember. So it's actually very helpful for us if we know, you know that information or that history. Okay, so if, if people have questions, I'll be um, right here in front of the screen. You can come up and ask questions. Um, in about 10 minutes or so, there's gonna be a cardio drumming exercise class next door. So there's actually a door here and over there that you can just walk directly into the room, or you can go back out into the exhibit hall um, and see our exhibitors, Go get some food in the break room. Um, you know, make the most of your day. And all the presentations are being recorded. So if you find two at the same time and, oh, I really want to go to both, don't worry. They will be online for you to um, see at a later time. Thank you.